Hello everybody, you're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news. We have a different guest on each week. We play local unsigned and independent music. We head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry. And we catch up with Twangling Jack Ford over in the Ilk Shed for a weekly album review. As always, you can email me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I particularly want to hear from poets, performers, musicians, anybody with mp3s to share, anybody who thinks there would be a good guest, anybody with local arts news, do reach out and let me know. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeated on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, we're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again and we're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. So this week we're going to be chatting to author Charles X Cross and he has been kind enough to send us a little submission to the Rylight Zone. This was actually narrated by his wife and it's one of his short stories. Over to Charles X Cross. The Man Butcher Prize by Charles X Cross. 1681, William of Fairshaw. Despite the countless revellers, William located his patron in record time. It wasn't difficult to spot her two-foot red wig studded with strawberries and a meringue fascinator. Even amongst the motley collection of masked gentry in their finest and most outlandish, she was unmissable. In contrast, William had opted for the more sober shades of his profession, plain brown and black linens to more easily cling to the shadows. Sheltered in a conveniently placed arbour, close as lovers, she pressed him against her excessive hooped skirts, whispering with murderous intent. That's him? The patron, who William only knew as the daughter, held out a slender finger, her excitement barely restrained. Strange, given that he would be killing a man in less than half an hour, and even more unusual because he could only assume the target was her own father. The one with the pig mask. William peered into the courtyard, spying between fronds and trailing flowers that gathered around the arbour. The target was portly, and though his long-tailed suit was of the highest grade, it pinched tight around his midriff. William wondered whether the suit was his own. If it had been borrowed, it would explain the ill-fitting nature and prove the man not as wealthy as he projected. It was often the way of a contract killing. The target owed money. In the judge's wig, William asked his patron, just as the man drifted behind a stem of blooming honeysuckle that obscured line of sight. (laughs) Pig mask over a pig face, was her only muttered response. William didn't think he was supposed to have caught that last part, so kept his attention firmly on the target. He shifted his position, found the target's wig and mask in the crowd, and tried to memorise every detail of sculpted pig. Everyone at the party was similarly disguised, and he didn't want to make some amateurish blunder by killing the wrong man. The whole mask was a bit of fun on the noble's part, but also aided more underhanded dealings, and William was sure he wasn't the only one attending who would be breaking the law that night. The target handed over a pair of tickets to a red-jacketed guard, straightened his wig, and led his lady guest through the large double doors. Even though his face was concealed by a porcelain mask, the rest of his attire was conspicuous enough to make him easily identifiable. The man was a renowned judge, and the wig he sported was the same one worn each day in court. Perhaps the gown draped over his evening wear was also judicial garb, but William didn't know enough about such things to be sure. He stifled a grin. This job would catapult him through the ranks without breaking a sweat. Here. The daughter delved her hand into a velvet pouch to retrieve a fine lady's wig and a mask that may have been intended for a child from the size of it. It's all I could find at short notice. When you insisted on supplying the items required... William halted the admonition of his patron, her piercing green eyes hardened through the holes in her plain white mask. She was paying him an awful lot of money after all, and only those with the loftiest stations in the Empire had leverage enough to take out a completely anonymous contract. It was best not to upset her. I do love a challenge, he grinned confidently, donning the small mask. The rounded edges that were supposed to reach his ears pinched the skin at either side of his eyes. And the weapon? William's hand instinctively patted his hip where his flintlock usually rested. He felt naked without it, but it was safely stored in a guild outpost. He wouldn't be without it for long. Once paid, he would retrieve it. Don't worry about that, it all thought it. One of her wide green eyes winked jovially. 
She tossed the wig over his head and pulled the powdered grey ringlets tight around the mask. There, you can barely even tell. It just looks like you have a freakishly small head. The people here are far too highborn to even mention it. The daughter discarded the velvet pouch between two pronounced tree roots, linked his arm and led him out of the arbour into the courtyard proper. They weaved deftly between the boisterous crowds of partygoers, those too irrelevant to be invited inside such a prestigious event. The tug at William's arm reminded him just how keen this woman was to be getting on with the sombre deed. Perhaps this job paid so highly because it had been rejected by more esteemed members of the Assassin's Guild, and he was the only one foolish enough to take it. He pushed negative thoughts away. They had no place in a killing. What mask does your partner wear? William tried to quell his nerves with details. They had been over the plan twice already. The daughter would get him past the guards and a potential pat-down, and then her associate would provide a tool with which to kill the target, a knife, garrote, or other such subtle weapon. If William got the target alone, he could strangle him, though it was far from his preferred method of working. Don't worry about my partner. He knows the plan even better than you do, I'd say. Remember, he'll call you Francisco Athino. And once he gives you the weapon, look for me. She indicated her tall red wig. I'll stay close to the target so you can find him easily. Then it's all you. Right. William didn't see the point in stating the obvious. Pale and blonde, he didn't look like he was from Caneo. At least he was familiar enough with the accent to approximate it, should anyone talk to him. They reached the building of austere white stone and imposing columns, halting at the end of a long red carpet that stretched from the open doors like a forked tongue. William could see inside to the light, warmth and wine, and wished he could attend something like this just once without having to spoil everything with a spot of murder. Francisco, Athino, and Geft, the daughter announced to the guard on the left, who, unlike his companion, was wielding a clipboard and quill rather than sword and shield. Mr. Sino, he ran his finger down the parchment and nodded. Welcome. William eyed the doormen for a moment longer, to ensure neither wore a firearm of any sort. Given their prevalence in the guild, William rarely saw security without one, but Fairshaw was a long way from most of the contracted murder, and nobles did love their traditions. Polished breastplates, heavy conical helmets, and soft-soled shoes encumbered with huge rosettes were hardly suitable for serious guardsmen. The escape would be much easier. It was a blessing these men had been so archaically outfitted. Thank you very much, gentlemen. William made his best attempt at imitating a Canaan accent, and bowed with a flourish so wild that his grey wig nearly slipped off. Though he had picked up a few accents from more worldly assassins and mentors, hearing it now, he could tell Canaan was definitely one of his weakest. The foyer was enormous, with high frescoed ceilings and two sweeping staircases leading to a viewing balcony above. Though the room was amongst the largest William had ever seen, it was made compact with the quantity of guests, waiters and servants of every discipline. Two men barked laughter with the confidence only provided by extreme wealth, and a few women in frilly dresses tittered along obediently. This way! The daughter led him into another room like a mother leading a toddler. He would not have endured such treatment in normal circumstances, but mingling with the upper echelons was new to him. He resolved to trust her guidance, for the time being. A multi-use auditorium spread out, sloping downwards to a wide stage. He had seen setups like it in various cities, rooms that could be used for a tea dance in the afternoon and dogfights in the evening. But, like the foyer, it was grander in scale than William could have imagined, and populated with even more outrageous costumes. A few guests sat talking in warmly lit alcoves of silk drapes and velvet cushions, but most watched the stage, where the host was bestowing awards on his fellow nobles. The daughter stopped for a time as if watching the acceptance speech being enthusiastically orated by the winner of the most modest award. William tried his best to look as if he was paying attention, while subtly searching for his target through the restrictive eye holes in his undersized mask. There he is, the daughter indicated the target in a huddle of chatting nobles. I'll join their conversation. You mingle a little. My partner knows we're here. Your weapon will be ready any minute, Francisco. With that, she unhooked herself from his arm and slithered away through the press. Out of his depth, alone in unfamiliar territory, 
William had been led every step of the way by his giddy patron. Instinct told him something wasn't quite right. More reasonably, he assumed it was because he was used to taking charge. An assassination contract was often no more detailed than a name, and in some cases a preferred method of dispatch. The patron never assisted like this, but clearly the daughter wanted a piece of the action. For the amount she was paying him, he shouldn't complain. Besides, his good reputation would be almost guaranteed after tonight. He sidled to the edge of the room, taking a glass of wine from a passing waiter's tray. He drained it to settle his nerves. Even at the periphery, he was jostled by puffed sleeves and sharp elbows. He would have to wait for the judge to visit the restroom. There wouldn't be anywhere else quiet enough to get the job done in secret. Francisco Asino! A jubilant man bellowed above the general grumble of the crowd. William stopped still. He had envisioned a quiet whisper in the ear, not to be announced to the entire party. Worse, it had been a summons from the host, prancing about on the stage. Mr. Asino, come and collect your award! William took a step, then faltered. There couldn't be another Francisco Asino here, could there? The fox-masked host was staring right at him pointing a gaudy staff of office so everyone assembled turned to watch. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Asuno has been voted. The man stood aside as his glamorous assistant wheeled a small tea trolley onto the stage. The most likely to make the headlines. A wooden crate sat on top of the trolley, which looked conspicuously like something an arms dealer would use to ship their wares. William swallowed as the crowd parted, and he resumed his march, his feet feeling heavier with each step. He almost stumbled as he ascended to the stage. We have a very special prize for you, the fox host continued. We know you'll be leaving the country very shortly, so we didn't want to weigh your baggage down with another trophy. Instead, we opted for something useful, something you can use at this very party. William reached the side of the fox host and thanked him in his pathetic Canaan impersonation. His fingers trembled over the box, rough planks clearly stamped with import marks. All eyes focused on him. Make it count, the fox host whispered, gleeful as his patron, and slipped into the curtained wings. William cursed under his breath, stuck on the spot, feeling entirely set up. There was only one thing he could do. He curled his fingers under the lid, and levered the course would open on squealing hinges. The daughter had taken on board his request for a garrote or knife, but had put her own spin on things. What lay before him, nestled in straw, was a kind of double crossbow. The weapon was fine enough, almost as finely decorated as his pistol, but far from the subtle instrument of death he had requested. Two knife-tipped bolts protruded above the stirrup, linked together by a thin wire. He looked up at the crowd. Only a few were turned away from him, his target amongst them deep in humorous conversation. The daughter was in the circle with the target, the main focus amongst their laughing huddle. She had swapped wigs with someone and was playing some kind of strange noble's parlour game, a good distraction should William raise the crossbow. The judge's focus was certainly held by whatever she was doing, so maybe her presence on the job wasn't such a bad thing after all. William's fingers flexed over the crossbow. While it was the polar opposite of how he'd wanted this job to pan out, it wasn't entirely a loss. There were lots of lunatics in the guild who garnered quite the positive reputation by publicly dispatching their targets, and it was a fallow year after all. It was tradition to go a little over the top in a fallow year. He'd heard a mad bomber had blown up an entire bridge to take out a single target a few months back, and ever since then, her name was on the lips of everyone in the guild. Perhaps this was just the thing he needed, a very public success to secure his name in the minds of any who sought a killer's services. He took up the crossbow and aimed it just below the judge's wig, so the garrote would slice off his head in a shower of fame-bringing gore and pulled the trigger. That was this week's entry into the Rylight Zone, courtesy of author Charles X. Cross. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Danny Cobain, and this is Seven Stars by Esther Hayes. Seven stars lost their light A burning sun knocked them out With all its blinding raging might A 
it smashed them apart like a child with the hammer Unconscious of the damage inflicting unaware of the impact of careless actions careless actions The stars had to learn the sun wasn't only to blame The stars had to learn not to let the sun play this game Seven stars lost their light and with them left the night left the sky night. blind Silly star should have known, should have, known. should have seen it coming a mile from home. There's nothing new here, trouble always follows the sun and all it's becoming. Stars had to learn the sun wasn't only to blame. The stars had to learn not to let the sun play this game. You played a game, always leaving me burned. I'm the one to blame for you, I always yearn. A scream foul play, you smiled and walked away For you, these things never matter to you Matters of the heart and nothing but clutter Seven stars lost their light Why did they never falter? Why did they never falter? With undivided dedication Unaltered they hope For the sun to have changed For the situation to have grown The stars had to learn The sun wasn't only to blame the stars had to learn not to let the sun play this game. The stars had to learn the sun wasn't only to blame. The stars had to learn not to let, let the sun play this game. You played a game. Always leaving me burned I'm the one to blame Oh, you played a game Always leaving me burned I'm the one to blame For you, I always yearn
That was Get On Your Boots featuring Henny Envy by Jazz Dylan. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain. And it's time for us to be joined by this week's guest, who is author Charles X. Cross. Uh, just about said that. Okay, so the first question is one that I ask everybody, which is, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Oh, um, I read uh, Gideon the Ninth. I can't remember off the top of my head what the, uh, what the author's called. Um, Maybe Tamsin something. I quite enjoyed it. Uh, we read it for, I have a, a book club. Mm. Uh, we read it for our book club. Um, yeah, it, it's, it has quite a strong uh, authorial voice. So we had a bit of a back and forth discussion about that. I quite enjoyed it. It's, uh, it's quite funny. I don't know if you've read it. <laughs> no, I haven't, no. Um, I mean, I was going to ask as well, what are some of the other books that you've read as part of that book club? Um... Some of my favourites, we've probably read um, Piranesi. Mm-hmm. That's a good one. Um, oh, we've read uh, Wild, Wild, Seed by Octa- Wild Seed by Octavia Butler. Yeah, that one's quite uh, that one's quite a dark one. It's a bit different to Gideon the Ninth. Gideon the Ninth. Well, Gideon the Ninth's about uh, necromancers, so it's, it's, it has a dark theme, but it's very um, told very like in a light-hearted way. So it's very fun. Wild Seeds, really quite dark subject matter. It's all about sort of slavery and being forced to, you know, being forced to do things you don't want to do. It's a really dark book. Um, yeah. We had quite a few people, uh, they enjoyed the way it was written, but it was just sort of a struggle for them to read. Um, but, it, it, you know, it inspired quite a nice conversation off the back of that. Yeah, which is what you want for a book club. Yeah, well, it's a book club where all, uh, well, all but one of us are all writers. Mm. Although the funny thing is that the, the one who's uh, who's not the writer often has the best insights. <laughs> <laughs> We're always telling him that he needs to write something. Yeah. But, uh, I think he's, uh, he's, you know... We're holding him to such a high standard now. I think he's scared to write something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure that's, I think it's an Oscar Wilde quote where, some, anyway, somebody said, um, I'm too fond of reading books to care to write them, which it could be that's the case as well. Yeah. I think you, uh, when you, you know, when you start writing a book, you, you sort of veer between thinking it's the worst thing <laughs> that anybody has ever committed to a page. And then sometimes you veer towards, you know, this is the best thing <laughs> yeah. anybody has ever written. I think there's like, like you as a writer, you sort of veer between those two polar opposite, opposites quite often. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, that brings me quite nicely on to because obviously I want to ask you about your book. So could you tell me a little bit about the books that you've worked on? Yeah, so so far I've uh, I'm writing a, a trilogy at the moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't really start off as a trilogy. I, I wanted to write a standalone book. It's sort of, so you can read the first book sort of by itself and be happy, but then there's there's two more that add on to it. It's about, uh, so the first one's called The Man Butcher Prize. It's about a an assassin who's, he's quite unlucky. He's, he's, he's good at what he does. He's like a bit of a sharpshooter, but um, he's had very, very bad luck. And... Um, it's all about how he he has to enter into this uh, competition. It's a bit sort of uh, like battle royale, mm-hmm. um, Hunger Games type thing. But uh, everybody that's in it, they're they're sort of like madcap assassins who they want to be there and they're having a great time fighting to the death. Everyone except for William, that is, who's there because it's his last option. Yeah. Oh, awesome! And you you describe your book as uh, gunpowder fa- uh, gunpowder fantasy, and I wondered if you could kind of give us a bit of a definition of, of what that means to you. Yeah, so it's um, it's like a so a high fantasy is is basically told in a different world. Um, an urban fantasy is sort of told in our world, but with fantastical elements. So the gunpowder fantasy is is a high fantasy. It's told. It's not set in our world. There's, there are sort of elements that are similar, so you can you can sort of look at a country and go, oh, that's a bit like Germany, or that's a bit like Italy, you know, just as for sort of comparisons. But it's set in a different world to, world to ours, but it's not set, it's not sword and sorcery, it's 
sort of beginning of like the industrial revolution, like they're starting to build train lines and things that, you know, they're fighting with flintlocks and rifles rather than swords and maces, although those do feature here and there. It, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit like a fantasy action film kind of thing. Yeah. Awesome. That sounds cool. And um, so what does the writing process look like for you? Because everyone kind of approaches writing differently. So I wondered if you could give us a few insights into sort of how you approach writing from when you first have an idea to, um, you know, f first draft of a, of a novel. Well, I think I started out as more of a, a pantser, they call mm -hmm. it. Um, and I think I'm more of a, a planter now. I, I, when I first wrote the Man Butcher Prize, I, I did it for a NaNoWriMo or a NaNoWriMo. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I said NaNoWriMo, uh, but um, so, but I didn't really have an idea. I just sort of, it was a couple of days before November and I just thought, right, I'm going to do it this year. So that the first sort of germ of the idea was like, oh, I'll write something about assassins. <laughs> and then I just went and I wrote 50,000 words and then sort of as I went, I started to think, oh, right, yeah, this is a good idea. What if, you know, this is then revealed to be this and you start to reference things back and then you do, I did start to sort of build a bit of a narrative. Obviously, then once I got to the end of that 50,000 words, the book, the first book's 120,000 words. Yeah. So I continued after that, gave it a, a good few uh revisions to get it all correct and then with the second book I was more a little bit more structured but still not I'm still not a full world builder planner I feel like perhaps it's maybe stems from a, a little bit of laziness I think <laughs> I don't find the sort of I, some people love world building I find it a bit of a a chore to write it all down yeah it's it's all in my head and when I'm writing it down that's when I'm writing this the book so for the second book I kind of I get the chapters in there and I do bullet points for each chapter so each chapter might have four bullet points you know William has to go here he has to see this this has to be revealed end of the chapter and then yeah. I just write it down and as I've sort of ticked off a, a bullet point that gets deleted off and then I just work towards the next one yeah, so I think that I'm, that's more of a, a plant, so I think. But as as there's definitely things like characters just come out of nowhere. Mm. I'll be writing a scene and I'll think, oh, this need like this needs. Uh, there are, I think, in the first book, there are referees who sort of the the the, the like the battle royale element just takes place in this town of assassins. Yeah, and they they get to just roam all around the city trying to kill each other basically <laughs> and um, there's referees who wander the city who make sure they follow the rules but um, they don't all necessarily follow the rules all the time so that I got to a certain bit where it's like oh the rules need to be followed now so a referee sort of comes into the story at that point yeah and that wasn't a planned thing it just it just happened. So then I've, I've got, oh, I've got a character now. And then you sort of work backwards from there. And by the time you get to a finished book, it's not like something just comes out of nowhere. It's, you know, reverse engineered back into the story. And But it's it's nice to sort of come across these things organically as you're writing. It's a lot more fun as a writer. Yeah. And I mean, I, I guess you've kind of alluded to this in a sense, but do you find that your characters often do things that sort of surprise you? Or, you know, do you break your um you know your plan at times because the character's done something that you weren't expecting them to do I, I i wouldn't i know a lot of people do i wouldn't go to that extent it's more i feel like i'm like the the evil puppet master yeah. <laughs> so it, it won't be that a, a character does something that i don't want them to it's more that i'll be writing and suddenly i get this like epiphany of yeah. what should happen and a lot of the time, that is something going terrible for the main characters. <laughs> uh, I uh, There was definitely a few things in the first book that I was gleefully writing. 
And then my readers have come back saying like, oh, I was so like horrified when that thing happened. And, you know, the, you know, they, they enjoyed it, but it was like, it was like tugging at their heartstrings. But when I was doing it, I was just like the, I was the one doing it. And I was like evilly laughing while I was yeah. typing away. <laughs> Awesome, cool. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with author Charles X. Cross, and this is Sandemus with Promises. That was Promises by Sandemus. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and we are joined in conversation now by author Charles X. Cross. And um, so you you mentioned as well, because um, I did a little bit, bit of research on you, so you mentioned you had an uncontrollable imagination even as a kid. And I wonder if you remember sort of your first story or the first thing that you created when you, when you were young. So when I was younger, um, I didn't actually do much reading. I was I was more into drawing and doing mm -hmm. comic books. Um, I used to do this. I mean, <laughs> I used to do this these comic books about this. Um, I mean, it doesn't speak wonders about my drawing skills, but I used to have a character who was a stick man <laughs> called Bob, <laughs> and he would have all these adventures. And his head was basically a balloon, and at the end of the comics, his head would pop, and that was yeah. probably. That was just my little joke. And I used to draw those in all the margins of my school books. And there's no, there's, I mean, most of them are probably lost now, but yeah. I don't think there was a single page in any of my school books that wasn't just covered in drawings and little characters and ideas. But I wasn't much of a reader at that time. English was one of my, I was one of my worst subjects, really. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned as well, it was, it was Darren Shan, wasn't it, who made you fall in love with reading? Uh, and I wondered what it is about Darren Chan's books that kind of caught your imagination. 
The, well, it was the the Cirque de Freak books that I really loved, and I really got into them. I uh, I think the the third one that's my favorite one. I remember we were on holiday once, and I read the whole book like on a long car journey. Yeah, and that was that was like a complete transformation for me. I'd never read anything before that really. Um, I don't know. It's just something like as a kid, it, it was quite dark, and it was also quite really easy to read. And that's something I do try and replicate. I mean, these aren't children's books or young adult books, but I'm really sort of particular about the books being easy to read and easy yeah. to follow and you don't get confused with, with what's happening. You know, it's not simple, but it's there's like a flow to it and you can get into the rhythm of it and um, hopefully it, it turns it into a bit of a page turn. And that's definitely what I found with Darren Chan's work. Yeah. And that's that's like a challenge, especially with something like fantasy. Um, and I suppose more so with things like high fantasy. But, you know, a common complaint about Game of Thrones, for example, is that there are so many characters that half the time readers can't remember who's who or why this person's important. Um, and so it sounds like that's something you've kind of actively addressed to, to make, as you say, to make your book kind of bingeable, I guess. Yeah, well, I hope so. I, I also... Um... With my second book, I've done um, like a previously on. So at the start of the book, there's a little two-page recap of the first book because yep. I know that, you know, readers aren't as likely to remember every fine detail as, as in-depth as I do. And, you know, I want people to have those like reveals of like, oh, this was this and that was that. Yeah. But without having... You know, sometimes when you're reading a book, you, you get reminded of things too often and they go, and of course he had the key in his pocket or something like that. And they yeah. do it so many times that you're reading it and you, and you sort of, I do anyway, I sort of spoil it for myself because I go, oh, that's being mentioned again. It must be relevant soon. Yeah. And then you kind of spoil it for yourself before it happens. Yeah. So I, it's a fine line to tread with keeping keeping the readers like in the know but also making sure that certain details, you know, the details aren't lost on them, but they're not, you know, shoved down their throats so that it spoils things that are coming up. Cause I really do love a bit of a twist. Yeah. There's definitely a few twists and turns in, in my books and they're, they're my favorite things to write. Yeah. You know? Well, and also, I mean, I suppose, again, you don't want to, at least for me as a reader like I hate it when it feels as though the author's been kind of condescending and just like trying to remind me and like treating me as though I'm stupid and I can't remember these things as well so as you say there's definitely a balance to not doing it enough and doing it doing it too much I think that's where something like uh, like beta readers mm. comes in and you, you've got to get you've got to get some feedback from people and you know people will say oh I can't remember this character or you know, and then then you might go back and, and work in a little reminder somewhere. And, and you, you, you've got to, you know, you've got to try and listen to people's feedback, but also balance it where you're still, like, in control, if you know what I mean. Because like, yeah. sometimes you get feedback from your beta readers and one says, oh, I absolutely love this bit. And then the next person says, I absolutely hated this bit. And then that's down to you to, to sort of, pick and choose which bits of feedback you think I mean they're all valid but which which you think you're going to incorporate back into the into the story yeah for sure cool so a couple more questions I wanted to ask you about your nemesis so what can you tell us about <laughs> your nemesis oh I don't want to tell you anything about my <laughs> nemesis <laughs> uh, so well he's the bane of my life Newton Webb obviously you <laughs> talk to him a couple of weeks ago now, probably. Yeah. Um, I think he <laughs> he was about to mention me, <laughs> and um, he he said something like, uh, "We all have our nemesis, don't we?" And then yeah. the conversation moved elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we have a bit of a love hate relationship. He's in my writing group. We yeah. uh, we basically we meet together, maybe once a week, well, once or twice a week, to tell each other how awful uh, each other's writing is. Yeah, and the, you know, we should quit. <laughs> and it's very, it's very good motivation, really. You know, it, 
not just you know about achieving goals it's about putting Newton Webb in his place yeah me. yeah and actually I think that's actually surprisingly common amongst all of the creative <laughs> arts like how many you know how many singers are there or whatever who who they, they were told by a friend or whatever that they couldn't sing when they were six and they're like right I'm gonna show them and then they have like a best-selling album so um, I think it's, it's, it's healthy to have a nemesis and I must find one for myself for the first yeah. opportunity. We're, uh, we're always sniping at each other in our newsletters. Yeah. We have a, a bit of a, I mean, I don't know if you've seen Toast of London, but um, we have a bit of a, a relationship like that. He, he likes to assume that I'm, uh, I think he likes to assume that he's Toast and I'm uh, Ray Purchase, but I'm not sure if it's the other way around. <laughs> Awesome, cool. And I wanted to ask you about your wife as well, because you mentioned your wife's an orator. And I think I saw, doesn't she write herself as well? She she does write. She's um, she's just uh, working on editing her first book now. She's not released anything. Yeah. Um, but she's sort of building up to that and building up to... Um, we've got all the setup now. We've got... I've built a little sound booth. We've got all the right microphones and things. And... And um, she's uh, she's going to start doing audio book narration, um, you know, as a service that um, people can pay for through things like uh, Audible's ACX program and yeah. privately, like people can contact her. But she's also going to start up doing um, a podcast where she reads, uh, you know, older older books out of that are out of copyright and things yeah. like that. Really, like old classic literature that. Maybe if people don't, you know, aren't, she'll read the ones that everyone knows, but I think she, she wants to share some that are, you know, more more forgotten about, you know, yeah. maybe voices that people don't hear so much underrepresented voices and things like that, awesome. uh, which which will be really fun when so we're hoping a few months and then she might start launching that. We've, we've got a trailer up for it at the minute. Cool. It's uh, called uh, The Long Lost Book Club. Awesome. And I mean, it must be must be good for the two of you to have each other to bounce ideas off and, and things like that as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I when I first started. Um, when I first started with the member prize, um, what I do now is um, I sort of save up the book, like my third book that I'm working on now, I'm saving it up and then I'm just going to give it to a in one but when I when I was writing the Man Butcher Prize as a bit of like a motivation tool during the first NaNoWriMo I'd write like however many words I think it's 1,300 don't you've got to do a debt per day during NaNo to hit the goal so I'd write like a good chunk of a chapter and then she'd she I'd give it to her and she'd read it out loud yeah and I'd be able to listen to it back so now, when I'm writing, all the characters' voices are in like her performance. <laughs> so when we eventually, once the th all three books are out, she's going to do audio books of all three, and then that's going to be sort of her performance is how I perceive it when I'm writing it now. Yeah, yeah, which that's, I'm really looking forward to. That's really cool. Awesome, cool, and um, pretty much the last question to end on. We've kind of mentioned a few of the books that you've got out, and obviously, I suppose you're focusing on finishing the trilogy. Um, but I always like to ask, what have you got planned next, and where can people follow you to find out more? Right, I have far too many <laughs> ideas. I, I have, I have so many. I have a folder full of ideas. I've got. I've got a science fiction one that's to do with, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but it's sort of to do with, with like brains and like the nature of being human, which is a bit more serious. <laughs> um, I've got one that's about um, people going to hell, but rather than being about punishment, hell turns into hell is sort of like a help self-help place okay yeah so that that's uh that's one that i'm wanting to write there's there's so many more <laughs> i've just got a list of so many ideas and, and it's just w when i finish this trilogy which one am i going to sort of pick yeah. up and start working on next but it'd probably be one of those that, like I, I i think what i'm going to do is when i finish this i might work in a couple of things in tandem like once I've not got the the pressure of like a, 
a deadline for finishing a trilogy. I'll, I'll yeah. sp spread my wings a bit, work on something serious, work on something lighthearted all at once, depending on how I'm feeling on the day, I think. Um, if people want to follow me, they can go to charlesxcross.com. Um, the best way to follow me is to subscribe to my mailing list. There's some brilliant insults thrown at Newton Webb in there, and also some stuff about what I'm working on, uh, potential like free book giveaways and things in there. Yeah. And of course, you'll let them know when the next books are out in the series as well. So it's nice to have that kind of reminder, because I often find that with authors, that especially indie authors, Sometimes I like, I forget to check in with somebody and then, you know, a year later, I think, oh, I wonder what happened to so-and-so. And I go to their website and they've got five new books that I had no idea about, you know. Oh, yeah. Some, uh, some indie authors are amazingly prolific. I, I only wish I could be that, you know. It's, it's a struggle sort of balancing, you know, writing a book, having a bit of free time and doing a day job as well. It's, yeah. it's like... I don't know how some of them do it. They're absolutely amazing. Big thank you to Charles X Cross for joining me. You're listening to the Arch Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Caitlin McAvoy with Beautiful. beautiful by Caitlin McAvoy my washing machine is going crazy but we're just gonna roll with it and uh, you know perils of broadcasting from home sorry about that and we're gonna head over to the ilk shed now for this week's album review courtesy of twanglin Jack Ford scissor sisters their self-titled first album whether it is the umpar disco of Laura or their other hit the acoustic driven take your mama which seems to me to have a touch of the pointer sisters about it the Scissor Sisters seem to be musicians and writers, expert in many genres. 
and having fun playing dance music. I would not say that the Scissor Sisters version of Comfortably Numb made me like the Pink Floyd version more, or that I prefer it, but it did make me re-hear the Floyd version as a song and not just some singing in between the world's two most favourite guitar solos, as voted in numerous pointless polls. I also did not think it was a joke. I think it is a very enjoyable interpretation. I'm sure there are those that would have told them to stick to their own genre of campy 70 disco and not meddle with the kings of prog. But I think it is an honour to have your song covered, however stylistically different from your original vision. The Scissor Sisters may even have accentuated the dark meaning of the song by setting it amongst the musical stylings of rave culture. The only time this album gets close to being funky is on a comedy social comment number, and the truest dance music is on the bonus tracks with some Nile Rodgers and Prince type guitar. The album comes to a grand finale with a very Bowie-esque number, with a production that makes it sound as though it would not have been out of place on Aladdin Sane. I am not in a position to tell you what Scissor Sisters means, but it is the name of the band and the first album. Scissor Sisters. Big thank you for Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. Thank you for Charles X Cross for joining us for an interview and for his entry into the Rylight Zone. As always, you can reach out to me here at the studio by dropping me an email on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. And I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s to share, local arts news, possible interview guests, etc, etc. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeat here on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again, we're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So that's about it for another week, and I'm going to leave you in the capable hands of our album reviewer, Twangling Jack Ford, who sent me this. This is Under the Cloak, his new tune. There's a buffet at the food bank To celebrate its opening in town And we're all in need of something But there's not enough to go out So many words in my head If only I could find a good cheer Today I read that someone said Dickens had big too soon So look under the cloak Hiding from the light In the world of sense of wants Are hiding away Hiding away The plague has made us weary The smell of weed hangs in the air And the drunks on the corner Are showing me how not to care And look under the cloak Hiding from the light Ignorance Hiding away, hiding away in plain sight Hiding away, hiding away in plain sight
don't have a clue And there's no point looking for answers when nothing 